Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Kim. I am the Korea Foundation and Kim Renaud Associate Professor of Korean Literature and Culture Studies in the East Asian Languages and Literatures Department at the George Washington University. And it is my pleasure to uh, host and moderate today's event. And I'm excited because uh, you know, I get to in introduce you to uh, a fabulous scholar. Uh, allow me to introduce you to Professor Christina Klein, who holds a BA in Film Studies from Wesleyan and PhD in American Studies from Yale. In addition to her book, Cold War Cosmopolitanism, which was just published by the University of California Press. She is the author of Cold War Orientalism, Asia in the Middle Brow Imagination, 1945 to 1961. That was published in 2003. Her articles on Korea, uh, on Korea and other Asian cinemas have been published in the Journal of Korean Studies, Transnational Cinemas, American Quarterly, Journal of Chinese Cinemas, Comparative American Studies, and Cinema Journal. She teaches film, American studies, and English at Boston College. Now, for those uh, who are really interested in her new book, uh, Professor Klein kindly shared her book that was published on open access by the University of California Press, available for free download. That's right, everyone, free download. Right? And you could also uh, watch director Han Young Mo's films uh, the director whom she will be speaking about today uh, on the Kofa uh, Korean Film Archive YouTube channel. So uh, I am so excited and I will turn over uh, to Professor Christina Klein. Tina. Thank you, Emmanuel, for that enthusiastic and uh, very kind introduction. I'm really happy to be here and I thank you for inviting me. <clears throat> And I'm very excited to share my work. I only wish we could all be in the same physical place together, um, but this is still very nice. Um, I've got a slideshow, so I'm going to show that and give my remarks over that, and um, and then we'll come back for our conversation. So let me see if I can do a screen share. Okay. So this book began. Hold on, I'm going to turn that off. This book began about ten years ago when I watched Madam Freedom, a 1956 film directed by Han Young Mo. I was supposed to be writing a book on contemporary Asian cinema and its relationship to Hollywood, and I was taking a bit of a deep dive into South Korean film. I kept coming across, across references to the scholarship in the scholarship to Madam Freedom as the most famous film of the post-Korean War period, and so I decided to take a detour and watch it. Um, the film tells the story of a middle-class professor's wife who takes a job in a Western luxury goods shop to supplement her husband's salary. The job immerses her in Seoul's emerging new society of dance halls, cafes, and consumer goods, and before long she is going on dates with her handsome young neighbor and embarking on a full-blown affair with her boss's husband. I was so transfixed by the film that I lost my interest in the book I was supposed to be writing, and instead I started watching as many of Han's films as I could get, as I could get my hands on. As an American Studies scholar, I was really drawn to Madame Freedom because it was simultaneously familiar and foreign to me. On the one hand, the film's style was clearly indebted to classical Hollywood cinema, and it looked pretty similar in many ways to um, Hollywood films in the 1940s and 1950s. On the other hand, however, Madame Freedom was clearly rooted in the contemporary conditions of post-war South Korea, with which I was not so familiar. There's a subplot about smuggling, and the husband is a scholar of the Korean language, and I had the, I had the feeling that I was missing some of the nuances of these storylines. Um, I also did not understand how such a technically polished film could have been produced a mere three years after the end of the Korean War, when the country was still struggling to rebuild and its people were among the poorest in the world. Um, so I started, I started watching more films directed by Han, and I loved all of them. Um, what really stood out to me and what attracted me the most to his films were the female characters. They were strong, independent women, their actions drove the storylines, and they engaged in remarkably modern behavior, all the while dressed in fabulous 50s clothes. So I was hooked. Um, I gave up on that other book project that I was supposed to be working on, and I decided instead to write a book about Madame Freedom and Han's other films. And this was despite a lot of advice from people telling me that this was a really bad idea for all kinds of reasons. Um, and after about 10 years of ceaseless toil, the book was finally published um, earlier this year. 
So uh, who was the director of this fabulous film? Han Hyung Mo was born in 1917 into an affluent Christian family. He attended art school in Japanese occupied Manchuria, worked in a department store, and in 1941, he moved to Seoul to work in the colonial era film industry. He studied cinematography in Japan for two years and directed his first film in 1949, soon after the end of the US military occupation. With the outbreak of the Korean War, he began shooting war footage for the Department of Defense and making documentaries. Han's career really took off after the war and he became an important player in the emerging commercial film industry. Madam Freedom was a box office hit that demonstrated that a well-made Korean film could lure audiences away from Hollywood imports and could generate substantial returns for investors. And the film helped launch what later became known as the golden age of Korean cinema, in which filmmakers produced a steady flow of high quality films that proved very popular with audiences. Although Han made films until 1967, his most creative period really stretched from 1954 to 1961. So the post-war 1950s was really his moment, and he became the most commercially successful filmmaker in this period. Han specialized in making women's pictures, that is films that foreground women's experiences and women's perspectives. He was deeply interested in women's relationship to modernity and in women as barometers of the sweeping changes that post-war society was going through. Many of his characters live ostentatiously modern lives and challenge patriarchal gender norms in various ways. Uh, Hand of Destiny tells the story of a North Korean spy who lives alone outside of any male dominated family structure in a lavishly furnished Western style apartment and who takes a lover and supports him financially. She even takes him shopping and buys him new clothes because she doesn't like the rags that he dresses in. Han's characters often have professional careers. The heroine of men versus women is a doctor. Pure love features an airline stewardess, which at the time was considered to be just the most glamorous job you could have. And because I love you centers on a professional dancer who tours internationally. Hans films sometimes included the work of real life professional women. A Female Boss, which is his film about a female magazine publisher, uh, features a dozen stylish outfits designed by Nora No, Korea's first fashion designer. And Han displays these fashions in a widescreen format with long takes that allow the viewer to admire, admire these clothes and inspect them at a, at a leisurely pace. Uh, Han's characters typically refuse to conform to the expectations of the men around them. The heroine of My Sister is a Hussy, for instance, is a skilled judo practitioner who resists getting married and spends most of the film beating up men who annoy her, including a pair of men who sexually harass her in a park and her own husband after he slaps her. So here she is with her husband and she's flipping him and he ends up on the ground. Uh, Han's film A Jealousy even features a lesbian character who seeks to create a home with her beloved and thereby save her from what she called the slavery entailed in marriage to a man. Han didn't make films about the lives of typical Korean women who are most likely to be living in uh, rural, living rural lives of hardship in this period. He was more interested in conveying the cultural trends and shifting values in urban life. And he captured the aspirations of a modernizing society more than its mundane realities. His films offered a visions of, po of a possible future rather than a widely shared present. Um, one of the things that's interesting about Han's films is that they're quite ideologically open. They're not simple broadsides on behalf of women's emancipation. Many of them end with female, the female protagonist punished or dead or restored to her home uh, in her proper position within a patriarchal family. This is one of the, from the final scene of Madam Freedom. And scholars have often focused on these endings and read Han's films as ultimately conservative and committed to restoring the status quo. Um, I disagree with that reading. Um, these endings are often quite brief, lasting not more than a few minutes, and they can't erase the preceding 90 minutes or so in which these women controlled the narrative and asserted their individuality. I take this ideological complexity as a mark of Han's astute commercial sensibility. He made films that could appeal to a broad range of viewers, from those committed to women's liberation to those who thought traditional Confucian gender roles were the heart of Koreanness and needed to be restored in the wake of um, Japanese colonialism and those, those threats to sort of Korean cultural identity. 
Um, so my book argues that Holland's films can best be understood through the framework of period style rather than through auteurism, which is a focus on the director as a, as a sort of his unique creative vision. Um, period style is a term drawn from art history and material culture studies, and it refers to any style that is common to a range of cultural producers who are working during a given historical period, um, and that expresses broadly shared uh, values and ideas. So I'm reading Han not as a unique art artistic genius, um, but rather as an exemplary figure. He was exceptionally good at working in a style and expressing ideas that were in wide circulation in the 1950s. Uh, my term for these widely shared ideas in this period style is Cold War cosmopolitanism. And this seems or can seem at first to be something of an oxymoron since the Cold War as it's conventionally understood entailed dividing the world into separate blocks and policing the borders between them. But the Cold War was a force of international integration as well as division, and it required binding the non-communist nations of the world together into new entities, which were known as, quote unquote, the free world and free Asia. Uh, and a lot of political energy, political and cultural energy in the 1950s was expended to incorporate South Korea into these international entities, international communities, and to encourage Koreans to see themselves as affiliated with Americans and with other quote unquote free people around the world. So this is the cosmopolitan dimension of Han's films and 1950s culture more generally. It refers to all the ways that Koreans were engaging with things foreign within a Cold War framework. Um, so Cold War cosmopolitanism has four main dimensions as I'm sort of defining it. Um, and first it had a political dimension. It was a political discourse about Korea's membership in Free Asia and the larger free world. And it was employed by Syngman Rhee and a whole host of American leaders in all kinds of political speech and policy statements. Um, Cold War cosmopolitanism also involved the incorporation of South Korea into these Cold War networks, such as the web of US military bases that spanned East and Southeast Asia. Um, second, Cold War cosmopolitanism had a social dimension. It entailed an optimistic attitude toward Western style modernity and a belief in the need to shed the oppressive aspects of Korea's Confucian heritage and the legacies of Japanese authoritarianism. And to replace these, um, these ideas and values with liberal Western values, especially individualism and freedom. Post-war feminists such as Helen Kim, who was president at EY University, and Lee Tai Young, who was Korea's first female lawyer, um, they really embraced Cold War cosmopolitanism and they used its ideals and its institutions to further their mission of emancipating Korean women from patriarchy. Uh, third, Cold War cosmopolitanism was a material practice of cultural production and dissemination that was linked to Cold War institutions. The US State Department, the CIA and US military bases created a lot of pathways through which all kinds of resources flowed into Korea and were used by Koreans to produce a wide variety of cultural products. Um, the Asia Foundation, for example, which was a CIA funded philanthropic organization, provided a lot of assistance to Korean artists and intellectuals in the 1950s. It financed Korea's first commercial film studio, um, for instance, which was stocked with up-to-date equipment brought in directly from Hollywood. And Korean filmmakers, including Han Hyung Mo, used this, it used this equipment to, to improve the quality of their films, which made them more popular with viewers and thus more profitable because they had bigger audiences, which in turn enabled more film production. The Asia Foundation also provided funding so that Korean filmmakers could participate in the region, regional Asian film festival. And this en enabled Korean filmmakers, including Han, to make films in partnership with Hong Kong producers, to, which is to engage in co-productions, uh, to export their films to Southeast Asia, and even to participate in some film festivals in Europe. Uh, and finally, I think about Cold War cosmopolitanism as a cultural style, which was characterized by the use of stylistic elements derived from Western models. Hans films, for example, drew inspiration from Hollywood genres. They incorporated music from Latin America um, and featured Western food. And Korean magazines, another kind of cultural form in the 50s that was very popular in the 50s, regularly included images of Parisian inspired women's fashion and, and modes of bodily comportment. Um, so to sum up, 
Cold War cosmopolitanism is the expression, I think of it as the expression of American and Korean efforts to modernize South Korea along Western lines and to incorporate it into the networks that were binding the non-communist world together. Um, and I think it's a useful concept. I think it helps us understand something about Han's films and also about 1950s culture um, more broadly and the 1950s itself um, as, a, as a distinct period in Korean history and a, and a distinct moment of modernization. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Um, well, thank you so much for that. And I, I think you really uh, contextualized what you meant by Cold War cosmopolitanism. And um, first of all, in your slide, I want to ask you, uh, because I have not seen it, my sister is a hussy, uh, a judo. Uh, is she a judo? So she's a judo practitioner, but is she an athlete, like uh, representing the country, or is she just a practitioner? She, um, she lives with her father and her sister, and her father runs a judo dojo. And he has, the mother has died. And so he has trained the girls, his, both of his daughters who are now young women to be uh, quite good at judo. Um, Is that to fend off any advancement from men? That's not that way in the plot. He just, I mean, there might be some verbal reference to why he does it, but there, it's not really explained terribly well. You know, the father thinks it's a good idea for whatever reason. Um, but then, um, I mean, the, the film is utterly thrilling to watch. And it, unfortunately, this is one of the films that is not on Kofa's YouTube channel, but it is on their video on demand site. And um, it, it wasn't film, it wasn't subtitled when I watched it. So I had a, one of my research assistants, a fabulous uh, Korean student um, at VC. And so she was translating it for me as we were watching it. And she was just like, I cannot believe that this movie, I can't believe this movie would have been ever made, even if it was made now. I cannot believe it was made in, you know, what is it, 1961, whatever it was. It's just, it's quite shocking and just utterly thrilling to see it. But is it a comedy or... Yeah, it is. It's sort of a it is a comedy. It's sort of a um, you know, it's a comedy. It's a, a bit of a sort of romance. Um, she does end up marrying this guy um, and it gets dark in the middle. Um, her father, she's a sort of a bad wife, right? She's beat, beats up her husband and her father says, you know, this is not acceptable. And he beats her quite badly. He says, let's go into the dojo. Oh. And he um, and it's a long scene and it is not nice to watch. And he just beats her and keeps throwing her down and throwing her down and throwing her down. And all the while saying, you know, you know, basically better a dead daughter than a, than a bad wife, right? You go, you have to learn how to be a woman. You have to learn to submit to your husband, you know, don't come back here. And she's sort of arguing with him and he just keeps throwing her down until you really think she's dead, that she's not going to get up anymore. And then she finally gets up and limps, limps away. Um, and then she goes back and goes home and keeps arguing with her husband and, um, you know, doesn't submit to him at all. That is very interesting because there's a North Korean film that has a woman as the, as a Taekwondo practitioner. Um, she represents her country and, um, and there is, it's a romantic comedy. So it'd be interesting to, uh, look at these two films. Um, yeah. Okay. So in your book, uh, first of all, I really, I thoroughly enjoyed reading your book. And by the way, again, available for free for those who missed it earlier. Um, you mentioned that the USIS aimed to win the sympathies of women so that they can in turn exert pressure on their husband, their Korean husbands and their governments to act in ways commensurate with US interests. So USIS was appealing to women so that the women could uh, somehow uh, convince their husbands and their local governments to participate with the U.S. Can you explain that a little more, please? Yeah, I mean, the U.S. targeted all kinds of demographics, right? They, anyone, any sort of population that might be useful. So, you know, students were one and, you know, workers and, and women. So women were just one part of one demographic that they thought, okay, this is a group that we can target and we can try to reach. And it did this all across Asia. It wasn't just unique to Korea. Um, but so they would produce material that was designed to appeal to women and that would feature women. Um, and so there was this kind of address to, to women. Um, and it was a kind of an interesting address because on the one hand, it was about 
sort of traditional domesticity, look, women being happy at home, you know, American women with their American husbands and their children, but they also showed women moving into public life, American women moving into public life. And sometimes even when that wasn't the intention of the material, they would just show women going about their business. So, you know, women having jobs or women driving a car or women voting and participating in elections. Um, and so there was this sense, you know, the US IS didn't have a feminist agenda. That wasn't, wasn't their goal, but they did believe women should be participants in public life. And so there was a sense of, part of a sort of encouraging that move um, because that was part of modernity, right? And that was part of the modernization of Korean society was to give up, you know, move away from these very old, old fashioned, very patriarchal um, sequestration of women just into the domestic sphere and say, look, they can be participants in public life as well. And it's important that they do so. That, that's really interesting because taking Madam Freedom as an example. And for those who have not seen Madam Freedom, please, please watch it. It's a fabulous film, right? And uh, Tina was right. There's this element of absolute familiarity. Like I've seen this before, the, you know, the setting, the clothes, there's a scene in the dance hall that looks all too familiar. Um, and yet there's this element of Koreanness because they're all Korean actors, right? And so it's like, it's a juxtaposition, a juxtaposition of the two cultures really colliding in this one film and it's absolutely fascinating. Um, so please go watch Madam Freedom. Um, but Madam Freedom has that, yes, strong female character who leaves the house like Sweet Dream. I don't know if you uh, have seen Sweet Dream. It, it sort of has remnants of that kind of Sweet Dream-ish uh, theme, um, juxtaposing that classic tale of Chunyang, right? The faithful wife who remains loyal and faithful to her husband, uh, even if death is upon her. Uh, no, this woman, uh, Madame O, just decides to leave and enjoys being outdoors, right? Um, and, and sort of flirting with other men. Um, but I've heard that the Korean audience at the time disapproved of what was happening on the screen and would even throw food uh, and boo at the character. Is that true? You know, I, I, don't, it, I don't know. It's hard to, um, you know, I've heard that about the housemaid, Kim, um, Kim Hyun is the housemaid that had that sort of hostile response. Um, I don't know how much of I've heard that with Madam Freedom, you know, and it's also, it's hard to tell. It's impossible to recover what did audiences think? What did audiences feel? How did they behave? We don't really know. Right. Um, it was fantastically popular. And I think that that popularity um, tells us something. Um, you know, the film, I don't, you know, she's not a very, she's not always a very sympathetic character, but I think that's kind of the point. Like a woman doesn't have to be virtuous. She doesn't have to be morally upright. Like a woman can just be selfish. A woman can have desires. She can pursue her desires. She can be sort of mean to her son and unfaithful to her husband. So it was a model of womanhood that was really new. Um, and I think that, you know, the viewers didn't have to necessarily approve of it to be kind of potentially thrilled by it or to be interested in it or to say, hmm, this is new and different. Um, so I don't know that it's, um, it's hard to know what, what women thought about it, but also it's like, you didn't have to endorse it to be interested in it. Um, you know what I mean? Or to see like, oh, this is a new way of being. This is, this is a new way of doing things. Sure, um, sure. Uh, so. I mean, you mentioned uh, briefly a new woman a trend that was happening in the early uh, 1900s. Um, and I want to ask, you, you devote a chapter on the opera girl, right? And I, I'm wondering what the difference or similarities are between the new woman in the early, uh, the turn of the century and the opera girl uh, after the Korean War. Yeah. So in the colonial period, there's various terms. So there's the, you know, the modern girl, and the and the new woman and the modern girl, um, as I understand it from the scholarship, is is much more of a kind of a discursive construction. You'd see her in magazines and newspapers and sort of um, you know visual and verbal representation, but was not a terribly common figure in in society at the time. And the new woman was also numerically small in population, but these were real women. They were um, early feminists. They founded institutions. They founded organizations. Um, so um, both Helen Kim and Lee Taeyang, who I talk about in the book, um, were new women in the colonial period. They make it through the Korean War, and they become quite prominent in the 1950s as holding positions of public responsibility. 
Um, so I use the term opera girl, um, which is not really that common in the American scholar, English language scholarship. Um, and actually it was one of my, my same research assistant sort of found this. And when she was digging around, she says, hey, I think this is really important. Let's, you should think about this. I'm like, oh, good idea. Let's, let's look at this. And um, so it was, it was in use at the time. Um, and it was often used in a very derogatory way um, as someone who, <clears throat> woman who had loose morals and who was kind of decadent and was having sex outside of marriage and just wanted to spend money on herself and all these kinds of sort of a, a bad behavior. She was a, you know, a snooty uh, college girl or she was a, a liberated housewife, you know, a woman who wasn't doing her duties and was going out and having lunch with her friends. So, and it often had a very derogatory set of um, associations with it. And I guess part of what I want to do with this is to say, um, let's, can we redefine that a little bit or can we refigure that, that, that category of, of woman and broaden it to be a, a kind of a, a modern woman in the post-war period um, who is seeking to expand her domain in all kinds of ways and isn't necessarily morally upstanding and upright. A lot of Han Hyung Mo's characters aren't doing fabulous things. They are selfish and have other you know qualities that aren't always that attractive, but that they they represent a kind of um, you know pushing back against patriarchy or challenging the family structure or an insistence on their own individuality and their own will and their own desires. Um, and I guess what I wanted to do by moving away from this idea of the apre girl as a completely just negative characterization of the modern woman um, was to put her in conversation with post-war feminism and to say actually in the 1950s there was a lot of kind of feminist um you know in the air there was there was uh the, you know helen kim was an important figure important public figure lee tayon was an important public figure feminist ideas were in circulation it was in the magazines people were talking about it um and so to put sort of Han Hyung Mo's films and those opera girl characters see them as part of a continuum with with a more respectable feminist discourse and say look there's a lot of ways that uh, people were thinking about women's roles and how they were changing in the 50s um, and and we need to think about those in relationship to, to each other and not just say oh the opera girl is ultimately what a lot of people have said is she's ultimately a conservative figure because she's so awful she ends up just reaffirming um, kind of patriarchal gender norms. And I want to say, well, wait a second, there's, there's, um, there's more going on with that. And there was actually a lot of positive depictions of working women um, and, and women who were, um, you know, wearing Western dress and engaging in certain Western activities. It wasn't all just negative. Right, right. Wow. Fascinating. Um, so there's a debate in my family. Uh, my son is the ultimate judge, really, and he decides whose pudechige tastes better, my wife's pudechige or my pudechige. But the kid is very diplomatic, right? He, he knows how to uh, appeal to both of us. Um, pudechige is a strong metaphor uh, in your book, and it really just captures what's happening in this period, post-Korean War, uh, but not only that, there's an element of cosmopolitanism within the notion of pudechige, right? And for those who don't know uh, what pudechige is, it's a Korean dish. It's like a hot stew um, with various kinds of ingredients. Um, the most, oh, I mean, there's kimchi. There's definitely kimchi and it gives it that spicy flavor. Um, but it has spam. It has uh, baked beans, and you know sometimes you get you, you can put in like sausages or Vienna sausage, depending on who makes it really, uh, with different vegetables. And of course, uh, to top it all off, you put um, um, you know instant ramen in it, and you stir it all up, you cook it up, and you just slurp it up, right? And it's a whole like communal dish, right? And it's perfect for on a rainy day and a cold day, right? So. Can you please explain to our audience your metaphor of this pudechige in your book? Yeah, so I, I talk about Han Yang Mo um, as in terms of pudechige cinema, right? Um, and it, I take it as this idea, you know, the, the story, the legend of how it was created was there was a woman 
who um, this was in, in Weijangbu in a camp town outside of military base and she worked in the kitchen and so she would smuggle out meat in her clothes. So she'd smuggle out spam or bacon or hot dogs or all this kind of processed meat. And then she would um, have set up a kind of a food stand and she'd sell it on the street. She'd put the meat in the, the kimchi stew, the jjigae, add the noodles, mix it up all together. <clears throat> and sell it and it was really popular and other people started making it as well and then you know now it's a part of the national cuisine i can get it at five places near my house um so and so the idea what was attractive to me was this idea of poaching that um in a period in the 1950s when people are incredibly poor and there's not a lot of resources um that the Koreans are actually incredibly creative and they find opportunities to get what they need to make things, like to make culture. So they make new kinds of food, but they also make movies. And so it was interested in this idea of poaching as something what, what Han Hyung Mo is doing with his films, which is, you know, taking things from Americans and, and, and America and Hollywood. And it, it, I like the idea because it emphasized the idea of Korean agency instead of Korean victimhood. And that these are cultural producers, creative people, they're going to do whatever is necessary to make their art. And, and so some of that is sort of poaching, textual poaching, poaching from Hollywood maybe. Um, certain kinds of camera movements or certain kind of genre conventions or you know poaching from japanese film which filmmakers were doing in the 50s all the time is remaking japanese films and and taking bits and pieces from japanese film um but then there's also literal poaching which is really taking things um and using them to make the films so so the black market is important in in this story that there's a lot of stuff that's coming out of u.s military bases into the black market um and then people are filmmakers are using that to make their films so they're using black market materials for cut to make the costuming for making decor um and they're using all kinds of american stuff even you know packing equipment that relief goods come through gets turned into um you know uh, you know rocks in a, in a mountain scene or the walls of an, in an apartment so this sense of just always um, looking to see how can I get what I need to make my films. It's even they're getting film stock. Um, and in, in, in Madame Freedom, there's a very famous in that dance hall scene that you referred to, there's an amazing, amazing camera movement. And it's, it's a crane shot, right? So the camera is on a crane. It can move up and down, side to side, backward, forward, because it rests on wheels. So the camera movement, this kind of camera movement was very much associated with Hollywood at the time, because Japanese cinema, colonial cinema, didn't have these kind of camera movements. So this is an instance of textual poaching, right? Han Young Mo is taking something that from Hollywood style and say, I'm going to use that in my film. Um, but it's also literal poaching because the camera crane rests on a set of U.S. helicopter wheels, military helicopter wheels that presumably were purchased on the black market that presumably came off a U.S. military base. So I think that's a nice example of material poaching, textual poaching. And out of that, you produce something new. You know, it's not just mimicry of Hollywood. It's like Bude Jige. It's a, it's a real authentic Korean thing, but it has that cosmopolitan element of drawing on, you know, American cinema or Japanese cinema or, you know, Parisian fashion styles or using, you know, music from Latin America and sort of bringing it all together and producing something that captures what's going on in Seoul in this period. Yeah. Excellent. I, I love it. Love it. Um, you know, we could talk all day about uh, Han Young-mo's films. Uh, one of my favorite is uh, uh, Hand of Destiny. Mm -hmm. uh, is that, yeah, that's a good one. Wow. Yeah. You know, that's a, that's a good thriller there. But I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to turn it over to our audience here who have, wow, we have a lot of questions. Um, right. So I'm just going to start reading off from the top. Uh, it looks like Gary's question was very similar to one of the questions I posed to you, which was about the new woman, right? Modern girl and new woman. So we'll move on. Uh, but thank you for that, Gary. Um, right. So do you think, this is from the audience, do you think that Madam Freedom would be as popular today as it was back in the 50s? Why or why not? That's a good question. Um, you know, I, I don't know. Emmanuel, your students, do your students like it? Do they find it popular? This um, question is actually from my student. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, there you go. Um, I think that it's, um, you know, I think it has a lot of similarity to Korean films today, which is it's 
well-made. It's kind of a genre film. It's a melodrama. Um, it's engaging with Hollywood. Like I think that Korean cinema today is doing a lot of the same things that Korean cinema was doing in the 1950s. And that Han Hyung-mo was really the, I think the, the originator of this, the well-made commercial entertainment film. Um, you know, I think in some ways it's, it's more progressive. I don't see in the, in the Korean films that make it my way, I don't see a lot of women. I don't see a lot of women's pictures. Um, women treated kind of seriously and taken seriously and pushing against um, sort of patriarchal norms and conventions. So I think in some ways it does, it still speaks to, it still has something to say um, in that sense. Whether people want to hear it or not, I don't know. Right, right. Oh, wait, whether people want to hear it, meaning whether they right, want like to hear whether it whether this whether this story would be would be popular now or or if it's people are not so interested in that for whatever reason right i mean with the whole uh me too movement that was happening in korea um don't you think a strong female character who really pushes and challenges uh social norms and patriarchal uh, boundaries uh wouldn't that be really appealing to koreans at this point i would hope so yeah. I would hope so. I would think so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But you do have to wonder why Why has the um, Korean Film Archive not put My Sister's a Hussy up on YouTube? Yeah. You know, why is that film not there? Now, maybe there's rights issues or something like that. Who knows? But it's. I find it interesting that that film is not there and right. is not easily accessible. Uh, you, you should write a letter. Um, so uh, another question is, why do you associate the Cold War with this era? Was Korea also involved in the Cold War with Russia? So I would say, yeah, the Korea, South Korea, Korea was a huge part of the Cold War. Um, the Korean War was all about the Korean, was all about the Cold War, it was all about the containment of communism. Um, and uh, it was the Cold War that really made South Korea important to Americans. Americans, frankly, didn't care that much about um, Korea until the Korean War. And, um, and after that, and because of the Cold War, you know, there's, you know, 100,000, tens and tens of thousands of, of military soldiers who are stationed there. Um, a lot of American aid is going there. Um, a lot of um, sort of assistance from ordinary Americans is being cultivated. Think about Korea, think about Korea, you know, send your pencils uh, to Korea. Right. Um, so there's a lot of cultivation of American interest in Korea and it's all because of the Cold War. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. This next question is really interesting. Um, it says, to what extent was Han's work under his own control in terms of uh, was there a studio restriction or what level of creative control did, uh, did he have? Uh, I'm going to twist it a little bit and add one more. Censorship at this time. Can you talk about what Han could do, couldn't do because of the existing censorship laws? Um, how much could he... Uh, be, okay, I'm going to stop there because I have a follow-up question, but yeah, censorship. So, um, th just to firstly say, you know, there weren't studios like the Hollywood studios system. So a studio in Korea in the 1950s was more like a studio space. There was, you know, sound stages or they weren't sound stages, but stages for filming and there was equipment and there was, you know, various kinds of sets and this kind of facilities for actors and stuff like that. So there wasn't the sense of like, oh, there's a studio mogul look leaning over his shoulder. Um, he was an independent, um, producer on some of his films. He was also, he acted as director, cinematographer, editor. He did lighting on his films. He was very involved in the set design and everything. So he had a lot of, of authority over the films. He also worked with other producers though. And, and so I don't know that all the details of like, what was his business arrangement? Was he picking the scripts? Was somebody else picking them? I don't actually know all that details. Right. Um, there's not really a lot of records from that period. Um, but the, to the censorship, there absolutely was censorship. There was real, you know, the biggest constraint was, was political constraints on, um, you know, no sympathy for uh, communism, no sympathy for North Korea, restrictions on the um, depiction of Japan and anything Japanese, Japanese language, Japanese, um, you know, food and cultural items. Um, no criticism of the United States and the U.S. military presence in Korea. So that political uh, censorship was the most important thing. Um, 
And, you know, I don't know that that was much of a burden for Han Young-mo. He wasn't, you know, uh, I think he was pretty much in line with the sort of political sentiments of the day. I don't think that was a big constraint for him. Um, but there was also sexual censorship for sexual reasons. And so Madam Freedom was, fell under the knife or the scissors, did have some material cut. It's not clear what it was. Um, and, and it's interesting. So, you know, one of the things people point to when they want to make the argument that Han was a, a kind of a conservative filmmaker is like he defended Madame Freedom as, um, well, it, it, it teaches a good moral lesson, you know, that she's punished in the end. But that came in the context when he was defending the film against censorship. So it has a kind of an instrumental quality of like, hey, don't censor my film. It's not a naughty, dirty movie. It's, it teaches a moral lesson, you know, which Hollywood does all the time. It's like, oh, you know, <laughs> it's not an exploitation film. It's a, it teaches a good lesson, right? Um, so, but he did, there definitely was uh, censorship um, on sexual grounds about what you, could sh what you could show and how much you could show. Yeah. Um, but he did have the, um, the first kiss. He's famous for Hand of Destiny has the first kiss, on-screen kiss. So. That's right. That's right. Um, would you say that Madam Freedom shows the U.S., U.S. bases, uh, U.S. or Western influences favorably, more so than some of his contemporaries like uh, Aimless Bullet, uh, Flower from Hell, A Flower in Hell, I can't remember the exact uh, American title. Um, yeah, so compared to his contemporaries there, who, you know, Aimless Bullet really shows the tragedy of the Caribbean. Flower and Hell also shows this kind of um, takeover of the U.S. bases and, and the Koreans trying to, trying to sneak in, uh, steal, and, and, and take advantage of the U.S. bases there. Um, but Madam Freedom shows a completely different light, right? It shows, shows this kind of positive light of American presence, right? Or foreign presence. So, so how, how, where does he stand in terms of... Uh, accepting this kind of Western influence? I think is that, I think you're absolutely right. It does have a much more positive feel to it. Although of course, if you're inclined to see the whole film as a critique of her behavior, you could say, oh, this all this American influence is bad. Um, but I think, and this is one of the, the, the factors of features of Cold War cosmopolitanism is a sense that, you know, Western style modernity is liberating. There are opportunities, let's move in that direction. We're ready for a change. Um, that there's a lot of positive stuff. It's also fun. Like, wow, that, that you know, Paris Prado music is fantastic. That Latin music is fantastic. And the clothes are awesome. And I love that purse. And who doesn't want to go shopping? And who doesn't want this, all this material stuff? Like, it's new. It's desirable. Um, and, and I think that, that there's a way in which that Han Young Mo definitely had, like, let's you know, let's not be afraid of modernity. Let's not be afraid of Western influence, American influence. Let's see what's there for us. What are the opportunities that it's, it, that it's creating? Um, and it's very, very different from the kind of social realism of aimless bullet, which is very, um, you know, turns a very critical eye on um, and has a, you know, is suffused with that sense of despair. And Han Yungmo wasn't, I don't think he was a very despairing guy. I think he was a pretty cheerful guy in a sense of what the sense you get of him from his films and from what people said about him. Um, you know, there's a line in the book, it's a quote from the period that he, ha he had a reputation as Korea's coolest guy. And, and I think what they mean by that is he was like the most modern guy and he was just on the cutting edge of everything. And he was a modernizer. He modernized the film industry. He had new technology and new genres. He had business in such a way new for the time and profitable. And he had a sense of film should be entertainment. It shouldn't be didactic. It's not about teaching lessons. It should be entertaining. So let me show you what's new. Let me show you what's exciting. Um, so I think in that sense, yeah, it, it was, is quite different from some of that, the, the sort of the realist films of that, of that period. Right. Um, and yep. he then suffered his career, you know, he's, he's in that post-war period. So after the Park uh, coup and the, the beginning of the restructuring of the film industry, you know, he doesn't thrive under that. He doesn't thrive under the sort of austerity um, and the attacks on decadence that you see under Park. And that was his world. And so he doesn't, he doesn't thrive in the 60s. That's really interesting because that's a good segue to the next question by Dominic. And that is, was there any public or political backlash or reaction to Han's use of cosmopolitanism, westernization in his films? 
um, you know, there was a lot of critique. I don't know necessarily of his films, but of the, you know, the corruption of the 50s and Rees corruption and, you know, black marketing and rich people sort of indulging in all kinds of consumption and behaviors. Um, and so that when you get the April Revolution and then the Parks coup, there was, there was a lot of, um, I think a lot of support for austerity and for scaling back and, and not spending um, Korea's precious, you know, sort of money and foreign exchange on these kind of luxury things like let's, let's buckle down and pull together and actually have some uh, development of the, of the, of the country. So I think that there was, if not a reaction against his films, there certainly was a reaction against that kind of, um, you know, both sort of, uh, of consumption and pleasure and fascination with the in in West and indulgence um, and sort of pushing against those, um, you know, more traditional Korean values that when Park comes into power that he really does push it and he really does go, you know, um, you know, frugality is good and austerity is good and hard work and, you know, women should have play their traditional roles and, um, and so I think the tone really changes from the 50s to the 60s. And, you know, there was a, a lot of, I think, support for that. Right. So a lot of Han's creative license and freedom sort of got restrained, tightened uh, in the 60s. And that's why he couldn't last very long in the 60s. It, just, it wasn't, I don't know that he faced new actual restrictions, but the world that he and the values that he um, liked to make his films about was just not as current you know as and it, it you know the society had changed and it was no longer quite as acceptable to um you know emphasize that kind of material um pleasures let's say right right uh so you mentioned here's another question you mentioned that uh many of han's films end in a way that seemingly reasserts patriarchal values but the endings tend to be overshadowed by the rest of the film. So that last five, seven minute ending uh, is not enough to say that, oh yeah, the film reasserts patriarchal values because the whole film, as you were saying, really shows this, um, this pushing of those values, right? Uh, but, so the question is, do you think that the South Korean government played a role in encouraging these generally patriarchal endings? So in other words, I guess the question is, um, did the uh, censorship, uh, did the um, sort of the, um, I don't know, what, what is it saying? So the government actually played a role um, in, yeah, in- I would say, I don't think there was government involvement at that level in sort of the filmmaking say, hey, you have to have this kind of an ending. Right. So no. I wouldn't say that. I think that he was a very smart commercial filmmaker. He wanted to get the biggest audience possible for his films um, because he wanted a big audience. He wanted to entertain. He also wanted to earn money so he could go on and make the next film. Um, it was commercial. It was commercial art that he was making. And I think, you know, to the extent that you can make a film that is accessible and acceptable to a broad array of viewers you're going to have a bigger audience, right? So if it's a, you can make a film that will be attractive to people who think, yeah, women should be emancipated or films who say, yeah, women, audience members who would say, yeah, women should be put back into their proper place. If you can appeal to both of those audiences, well, that's bigger than if you appeal to just one. So one of the things I like about his films is that they do have that openness. They do have that complexity. Um, my reading is that the endings are very brief and the bulk of the film is about the challenge um, in most cases that women are presenting. Um, and I don't, um, I, in part of the things I do in the book is what I call reading against the grain. And by this, I mean um, reading against the grain of the narrative. So if you're coming, if you're thinking of film in terms of narrative, well, then the, the ending's really important, right? Where does the story end up? How is everything resolved? The end is the resting place where meaning is articulated and solidified and say, okay, we've, we've engaged with all these ideas, we've been tossing them up in the air, here's where we come down. Um, 
so what I mean by reading against the grain is reading against the grain of that narrative closure and narrative primacy as the place where meaning is made definitively. And especially in the kind of films that he makes in melodramas and women's pictures, there's all kinds of other stuff going on that are very meaningful, whether it's the cinematography or the costumes or who you identify with or the use of sound. Um, all of these things that are connected to the narrative but are themselves not narrative elements. And I think a lot of that is involves presenting these women as the object of viewer identification, presenting them as fascinating and as as spectacle, like as inherently interesting in their own right. Um, it's where the bulk of the film's resources go are to lighting these women and decorating these women and putting their makeup and they get the big camera movements and they get the resources, right, are all on these women. So I think that's why I'm inclined to say um, to read against those endings and say they are not, they're important, but they're not truer than what happens prior. That's an interesting point, actually. Uh, so I, I have a real uh, um, specific question. Does he ever use the camera? So I'm trying to look back and think back at all the films and even Mad and Freedom. I don't recall uh, director Han using the camera to focus on the woman as a sexual object. And you can make an argument for the, for the singer at the dance hall, but um, typically like in the 40s um, uh, Hollywood films, when a, whenever a woman enters the scene, the camera starts from the, the, the shoes, goes up her legs and you know, does that whole panning of the body, right? And it has the male gaze on the woman, right? And then, and then she has this kind of like hazy, the lighting is different for women, right? Uh, she has this glow, right? I don't recall Madame Freedom having that or, in, or A Hand of Destiny having that. Um, so I, I'm not sure, I, I, I don't wanna generalize, but just based on those two films, I, I, I don't recall him sexualizing, um, you know, the woman in, in the way that Hollywood did in the 40s. I don't know, would you agree? He does in some films. Um, Pure Love is one. Okay. Um, and that's, that has like a, it's like it has a fashion, it has a kind of a fashion show in it, right? Um, it, early on in the film and the, it's the stewardess woman and she's, um, she's kind of an opera girl, she lives alone and she's caught in a boating accident and she nearly drowns, but she's rescued by a painter. So when she gets out of the hospital, she's like, I wanna find that guy again. And she's quite interested in him sexually. So there's a sequence in which she's strolling up and down the beach, looking for this guy day after day. And in each time she's wearing some beautiful outfit. So a very skimpy t-shirt, very tight t-shirt. I showed that picture, tight, short, very short shorts, tight white t-shirt very revealing um, or other kinds of dresses or she's even a bathe in a bathing suit what looks like a flesh colored bathing suit so there is very much that um that kind of she's eroticized sexualized but it's also it's a fashion show so in that sense who's real is the men are the men male viewers really interested in the fashion show or is this for the women who are more interested in the fashion show so even in that kind of a kind of a male gaze i think there's also he's giving something to the to the female viewers as well Interesting. And Young Sun Park asks that very question. Opera girl as a style. And, and I think you just sort of touched upon that, right? Uh, it's, it's not um, just a movement or an idea that circulated during this time, but it was used, utilized as a form of style. And, and so you just mentioned about how it was like a fashion show. C can you expound a little more on that um, for Young Sun Park? Well, I think that... Um... You know, the clothes are, one of the things that's interesting in the 50s is that clothes are very, very expressive in the 19, in the films of the 50s. It's a time when um, Korean clothing is changing for women, um, that women are starting at, at, in large numbers to stop wearing the hanbok and move into Western dress, but they're also still wearing the hanbok. So in a film, clothing becomes very, very expressive. What is she wearing? What does it mean what she's wearing? That she's wearing Western dress, she's wearing a hanbok. What is it, you know, this character wears one thing, this character wears another. Oh, but this hanbok is very stylish. It's new fabric, new patterns. Um, so clothing becomes very expressive because it's in flux. And so all the, it can be used for, for storytelling and for characterization, um, what women are wearing. Um, but it also becomes very interesting, an object of interest for female viewers. And um, 
there is interest uh, interviews of this of um, of one actress who is very what's her name Um Angran I think is um, I'm mangling her name sorry. Um, and she later interviews would say, oh yeah, people would, would want to go see my films because I want to see what I was wearing. Yeah. You know, what's the purse she's carrying? What clothes is she wearing? Who cares what the story is? We want to see what she's wearing. So that sense of that fashion is becoming, um, it's a new thing. It's an object of interest, especially for young, for younger women. And, um, and so that sense of sort of clothing as spectacle, that's just inherently interesting in its own right, regardless of the character and what happens to her. Um, but what's, what's that shoot, suit she's wearing and how does she, how is she is accessorizing it becomes interesting to viewers then. Yeah, I, I think that happens in cinema all over the world, right? Uh, it's not particular to Korean cinema, I mean, Hollywood, uh, even TV dramas, we, we wanna know, uh, you know where we can get that outfit. Um, Hairstyle. Hairstyle is a big thing, right? And it has a huge influence on, on the audience, not just women, but men too, right? Um, men want to emulate like the uh, actor on, on, on the big screen. Um, yeah, so let me see. We have, a, we have another question here. Um, it says, it is well known that the post-war American and Western influence in South Korea was incredibly prevalent and played a part in the development of the golden age style of cinema. Given this, how do you differentiate or navigate this influence and ideological apparatus while focusing your argument on period style? Navigate this influence of this uh, golden age and the ideological apparatus sounds a little bit like Althusser here, uh, while focusing your argument on uh, period style. Tina. Uh, <laughs> that's kind Tina. of a mouthful of a question. <laughs> um, I guess I would say like the period style of Cold War Cosmopolitan is all about that American influence. Like that's a defining feature of it is that kind of engagement with it um, in a, a kind of an optimistic way, I would say. Like that, that's a big factor in defining what it is. Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. Um, and, and would you say South Korea sort of identifies with this uh, American influence? Um, you were mentioning poaching, right? So um, when, when Koreans would watch uh, like Han's films, do they make that connection with some of the Hollywood films that they've seen simultaneously, like that certain same period? You know, again, it's, it's impossible to know what audiences are thinking, right? We always want to know, but we don't know because there's no records, right? People didn't write down, here's what I thought when I was watching Madam Freedom and here it's going to end up in an archive, right? It just doesn't. So right. you don't really know. So it's always the case, you know, in a book like mine, you're using, you're trying, you're sort of extrapolating from the films themselves, from what is in the historical record, from other kind of cultural material that's out there and you try to sort of piece it together um and that's sort of the best you can do but you don't really know um exactly what people are thinking um the korean film archive has these um amazing oral histories which is a tremendous resource of filmmakers um all kinds of filmmakers and a, and a bunch of them are with people who are from the 50s and early 60s who worked with han hyung mo and so from them there, you can get a sense of what were, you know, what were they thinking about his films? And so there are some really enticing bits there. And so one of them is, um, it's uh, somebody who's saying, you know, we, he, the kinds of female characters he had were not at all typical. Like he was the only one who was making, having female characters like this that were so, they were very active and they were very assertive and that was very unusual. Or talking about Hand of Destiny, um, which is, has this amazing, she, this apartment that she lives in is incredible, you know, yeah. it has, she's got all this Western furniture and a bed and a big round mirror and she has a telephone and she has lamps and she has this wild textile cushions on her, on everything. And it's just astounding. Um, and, you know, someone on the crew is saying, wow, like, I've never seen a house like this before. Like, this is not what we grew up in and you never see this anywhere. Right. Um, or, um, you know, the dance hall in Madame Freedom, that's no real space in Korea looked like that. That's an invention of Japanese magazines and American magazines and Hollywood films. And 
Um, so he's creating something that's, that's very, very new. And I imagine some people really liked it and some people were offended by it. You know, I think it's, there's not just one, there's not just one answer. There's not one response. I think a lot of people would have said this is appalling and wasteful and decadent. And other people would say, you know what, that's pretty comfortable. You know, I like that, elect I like that electric fan. I'm hot. Right, yeah. right, right, right. Um, there are two questions that I want to save for the end, uh, but continuing on, uh, have you read or seen the film uh, Kim Ji Young, Born 1982? No. No, not yet. Okay, okay. Um, you know, uh, the student was asking if Madame Freedom uh, is a more modern version uh, of Kim Ji Young, Born 1982. Um, Kim Jong, uh, born in 1972, uh, 1982, sorry, uh, really showing this uh, heavy patriarchal society in Korea, modern Korea today um, uh, that's been lingering on for centuries, right? And how a woman can, how a woman sees herself in that kind of restricting society. So, um, you know, I guess a student is asking whether this has that kind of uh, if Madame Freedom uh, has that trope of, you know, the woman's desire to escape this kind of social restraint. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what it's all about, is that, that wanting to escape. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things I talk about in the book is that the sort of the Ib influence of um, Ibsen's A Doll's House, which yeah. is all about um, a woman who realizes that she's sort of entrapped in this family structure and she's just sort of a plaything, and she doesn't have any she's not a full human being she's not a, an individual she's and, and so she leaves the house right and so i think that there's a real connection with that in madame freedom is she leaves the house you know she walks out she gets a job and what does it mean when a woman leaves the house you know um is 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 she shamed and humiliated because her sexual virtue is in is being you know at risk or does she um, pursue her own interests and find her own interests? Um, and so I think that, that 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 sense of what happens when a woman leaves the house and that desire to leave the house is something that you find certainly in Madame Freedom. Um, but also in, in My Sister is a Hussy, after that scene where she beats up her husband, you know, she walks out, she's like, I'm gone. And she leaves the house. And so this thing of, I think, is you do see in Han's films, and, and other films of the period, what happens, what does it mean when a woman leaves a house? And so other directors, um, you know, women were entering the workforce um, during the Korean War in large numbers and after the war. And so there's lots of films that are about this. And, and Shin sun -ok, who's another director, slightly younger than Han Young-mo, he makes a cycle of women's pictures um, in this period too. And he's much more interested in that uh, his stories tell are much more about the shame and humiliation that follow when a woman leaves the house, that she's much more likely to be, have to do things that she doesn't want to do and her honor and her virtue are threatened and she's trying to get back into the house or she retreats to her family. And so he's more interested in the, the shame and humiliation, which is the more traditional thing. Why should a woman stay home is so her virtue will not be sullied outside the house. And Han Young Mo is, I think is not at all interested in that and his women, they're, they're never worried about um, shame and humiliation in public because their sexual virtue is never an issue. Like they're not, they don't care. That's not what they're interested in. Um, so they can't be shamed and humiliated in that same way. Um, and Hand of Destiny is amazing because this, this woman, she's a North Korean spy, she lives alone. It's quite clear, she falls in love with this guy, he spends the night, like it's pretty clear that he spends the night in her yeah. bed. And then she's like, hey, let's go, you know, I don't like your clothes, let's buy you new clothes. Like you're not, let's doll you up. Mm -hmm. And after the shopping trip, this is an astounding scene, she brings him back to her apartment and he's primping there in front of the mirror and she's looking at him and she's like, mm, you look pretty good to me. And he's perfectly happy being looked at, yep. you know, the complete inversion of, I mean, the whole film is such an inversion of this sort of gender hierarchy Love and, it. you know, right down to who possesses the gaze and who's being, um, you know, who are the, who's, who's bestowing expensive gifts and all this kind of stuff. All right, that's it. I'm teaching Hand of Destiny next year. All right, that's it, that's it. <laughs> you, you've convinced me enough. I, I love the film so much. Yeah, yeah. Um, an interesting question is from another student. Um, Madame O in Madame Freedom 
is the only one who gets punished. Uh, what does that say about her uh, desire to modernize and, and you know, become that you know, strong woman when she is brought back to that kind of patriarchal rules and structures? Yeah, I think there's often, uh, almost all the films, you know, and the other thing just to say is lots of his films are lost. So it's very hard to make claims about his body of work because so many of the films have been lost. But in a lot of the extant films, the, the women absolutely are punished. You know, they're, they're, they're humiliated, they're beaten, some of them are killed, they, um, they're restored to, you know, the happy ending is they get to get married and live and be domestic, which is what they have not wanted out through all the rest of the film. So there's all kinds of ways I think that theme of punishment is very important. Um, and part of it is, as I said, you know, it's an acknowledgement of that these, that patriarchal ideals are still very much alive. They're very important. They're very forceful. So it's part of that, the reality of what's out there. It's part of appealing to a broad audience. Um, but there's also something I think about punishment that is different with Han Fring, Han Mo for other directors, which is they're not suffering, right? Yeah. And so this ideal of the Korean woman of as, as, as endlessly suffering, and there's something noble in that, and there's something heroic in that, and there's something beautiful in that, and they're suffering their self-sacrifice, and, you know, and which you do see in a lot of films. And his, his women don't suffer. Yeah. They don't suffer. You know, they might be beaten nearly to death, but that is- in slapped. Response. She slapped, right? Yeah. Right, right. But that's, they're punished in response to- actions that they have chosen right. and actions that they have taken and the exertion of their own will. And so they're punished as individuals for, for making choices that an individual makes. They're not suffering because that's what women do. Um, and I think that's actually really important because the, Han's female characters are individuals, they're individual people. And that claim that a woman is an individual, like that's quite radical. Like that's what the, what the feminists in the 50s were pushing for is that women are individuals. They're not defined exclusively by the role within the family. Um, and Han's films put the woman as individual on screen. Right. And, um, and, and, and an individual can be punished, whereas sort of woman is, is as a category is doomed to suffer. Right, right. Uh, I'm gonna take two questions and sort of mesh them together and, and hopefully you'll be able to answer both of them. Um, they're not, completely related, but we can find some relation. And that is, um, how, do you know how much Han was exposed to Hollywood films? Yeah, everybody was exposed to Hollywood films. Um, Hollywood films had been, you know, dominant, the, dominated the market during the colonial era uh, and after the Korean War. Um, so it was really only a short period um, during World War II when they're locked out of the, out of the market. But yeah. Lots of, um, everybody was seeing lots of Hollywood films. Okay, all right. Um, this question, this next question is from um, someone right across the street from Boston College, from Boston University, uh, <laughs> from Yun Zun Yang. Thank you so much for the super clear present. Ooh, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. Uh, I would like to hear more about your distinction between a producer of period style and auteur. Exactly what made you hesitate to call Han an auteur? Isn't an auteur embracing his or her contemporary style to a degree? It's sort of a difference in emphasis um, in that a notorist approach um, is focuses, you know, the emphasis is on sort of their individual creative genius and a period style is just, is, is a much more cultural historical view of like, let's situate this, this filmmaker in a, in a, the broader culture and look at how their style is shaped by political concerns or military conditions or economic conditions, all those things surrounding the film. So I think Han Hyung Mo does have quite a distinct film style um, and one could consider him an auteur and I'm not opposed to that, but I, the, the approach that I take is different. It's a much more cultural history. Um, and I think it recognizes, again, this idea that he's exemplary, not unique. He's really, really, really good at what he does, but other people are doing similar things as well. And you can see that in magazines and you can see it in other film directors and you can see it in, in all kinds of other places that this, th people are thinking with the same set of ideas. Um, and he happens to, he's really good at just getting it absolutely right um, in his films, but other people are doing similar things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Jenny Wong Medina said, uh, my sister, my sister is a hussy was on YouTube channel for a while. Was it? Yeah, but Kofa shuffles the roster of the films from time to time. Her class loved it. Sad to hear it's gone now. Oh. So, yeah, you and Jenny should write a letter. So, <laughs> yeah, I'll write the letter. <laughs> bring it back. Bring it back. All right. Uh, okay, another question. Oh, we, you know what? We have a lot of questions. I'm hoping that we can really get through all this, but uh, also a lot of the questions overlap, so I'm going to try to avoid the ones that you've already uh answered all right so can you talk about the methodology in your book divided into contextual and then textual analysis in, in the two parts for the text mainly thematically organized uh, i'm guessing from the chapter titles it's interesting that you discuss the material reality such as the use of the crane shot and the apparatus found in the black market so your research also involved the material aspects like sort of like a like an archaeologist. Were you an archaeologist? <laughs> I feel like an archaeologist. I think that's great. Yeah, I'm an archaeologist. Indiana so the, Klein, Indiana Klein. Yeah. The, so the book, do, it does have two parts. The first part is cleverly, it's called period, and the second part is called style. So the first two chapters are much more of the, the kind of the world, you know, what, trying to paint a complex picture of what's happening in Korea in the 1950s. So there's kind of political history and, and social history with um, feminism and um, kind of cultural history, this idea of public cultures, what's, what's happening with the film industry and other um, cultural institutions like Yoan Magazine. So that's the sort of trying to pre uh, paint that big picture of, of, of what's happening in politically and socially and culturally. And then the remaining chapters, they're actually not organized thematically at all. They're organized according to different elements of film style. Because um, I think of the book as very much a cultural history of film style, Hans' style of making films. So, which I think is actually a kind of an interesting thing to do is how do you historicize style? So how do you historicize camera movement? How do you historicize the use of sound? How do you historicize uh, a kind of style of mise-en-scene? How do you historicize his interest in spectacle? So all of the chapters are organized by the stylistic category. Um, and something I say throughout those chapters is I want to think about style in two ways or a particular formal element. I want to think about how it's used expressively within the film um, to express theme and characterization and move the story forward. And then how can you think about style as historical evidence? And this is something I take from Jules Prown, who is an art historian and material culture studies guru. Um, and he said, you, you know, style is itself historical evidence and you could read style as a kind of evidence and it can illuminate things that other regular historical documents in an archive can't necessarily get you to. So thinking about, if you start thinking about style and how do I understand the style and why was this style occurring now, it takes you in all kinds of interesting ways. So, um, you know, I did this whole thing on the black market. No, maybe nobody else thinks the black market is interesting. I think it's really interesting. Yeah. Um, so I spent a lot of time digging around to try to understand the black market. Um, and that's the archaeology part in a certain sense is how do we see that, um, you know, his style of mise-en-scene, his costume and his decor is so connected to, um, you know, the black market, which is itself so connected to the U.S. military bases, which is itself so connected to smuggling in from J Japan, which is drawing on colonial era uh, networks and immigration patterns in Zainichi in Japan. Um, and so if you want to understand how did, you know, where does this purse come from? It's like, well, let me tell you where that purse comes from. Like, you have to understand the Cold War if you want to understand where that purse comes from. Um, so that's, that's a little that's what I mean by sort of cultural history of style. But was Han conscientious of this kind of product placement? So <laughs> product placement. So that's an interesting question. So product placement um, and poaching are two very different things, right? Product placement, I just so you know, when I graduated from college, I worked in the film industry and my job was product placement. So <laughs> I was the product placement lady. Um, so product placement is when you put something in your film for the benefit of the, you know, the company that makes that thing. So there is an example of product placement in one of Han's films, it's uh, a female boss. And Han Yimou's art director that he worked with regularly also worked designing logos for companies. So one of his, his clients was Crown Beer. So when the female boss and the young, handsome young man that she's trying to seduce, they go to a nightclub, 
and there's a dancer or singer in a band and right smack in the middle behind them is a flashing neon sign for crown beer, right? That's product placement because the point of that is to like get a little free advertising to his client, right? So the beneficiary of product placement is the company. Um, poaching is in which a weaker entity takes something from a stronger entity like Koreans taking something from Americans and they use that stuff for their own purposes and for their own benefit. So, you know, the shoes, the purses, the handbags, the, the, the you know, all that kind of stuff, that's not benefiting, you know, the, co the can of Coke, the can of Coke is a perfect example, right? Coca-Cola could not be legally imported, right? Into Korea. So all the Coke that's in Korea is black, has been, is black market Coke. So it shows up in films all the time, but that's not product placement because Coca-Cola is not benefiting. The Coke can is purely for the benefit of the filmmaker who says, this is gonna help me, you know, characterize these characters and, and sketch in a world or a situation or a relationship. So, so that's really the difference. Uh, this question is from James Hilmer. In your first book, well, wow, going back to your first book, you talked about, uh, you've centered on different set of cultural formations that arose out of the geopolitics of the Cold War. Does it seem like there is more emancipatory potential in this set of Western influences, feminism, for example? Or is it just a happy consequence of the otherwise insidious cultural Cold War? Simply put, are these Western slash U.S. influences in films co-opted to push a U.S. Cold War agenda? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, everything that the U.S. is doing is to push a Cold War agenda. You know, the U.S. is looking out for its own interests. And, and, and the whole cultural Cold War is in the service of maintaining governments in Asia that are sympathetic to the U.S. interest and allied with the U.S. So that ultimately, whatever, anything else, that, that interest is always the bottom line. Um, you know, they're not interested in promoting feminism for its own purposes, and they, they wouldn't even recognize that. They would, no one in the U.S., I think, would even think of that. Um, I think that that's, that's sort of the poaching. So, you know, people can use those Cold War networks, you know, people like Helen Kim and Lee Tae Young use those Cold War networks for their own purposes, right? So they are pursuing a feminist agenda using the, the resources and networks of that the, you know, the Asia Foundation, which is the CIA, is making available to them. So um, that's a yeah. sort of, a, I don't know if that answers the question. But to bring, just to bring say a word just about the first book and the second book, you know, obviously they have similar titles. Um, and I do really think about the second book as a kind of a sequel to the first one in that they, they're both talking about the same period. Obviously, they're both talking about the Cold War in the U.S., this idea of the integration of the free world and, and the integration of the U.S. and Asia into an alliance. And um, so if the first book is all about the pressure that that exerts on American cultural producers, then the second book is about um, how is that also exerting pressure or creating opportunities for Korean cultural producers? So it's a side of sort of a thing to see like that the Cold War, the cultural dimensions of the Cold War are happening in two different countries at the same time in very different ways. But the pressure, the Cold War is exerting these pressures on both, uh, on both countries' cultures. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and another question asked, wh why cosmopolitanism and not uh, Americanism or transnationalism? I think that um, I think Americanization is too narrow um, for one instance, that it's only focused on America. I think it also has a, a kind of a coercive tone to it. And um, the cosmopolitan, transnational is a little, that's a good term. Um, it's a little bit neutral. And I think that cosmopolitanism gets at the idea that it's not just the US, you know, there's, 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 you know, Latin American music coming out of Cuba and Mexico, the mambo. There's, you know, Nora Noah is looking to French fashion. Um, there's actually all kinds of uh, films that are in, in circulation in Korea. Not, you know, Hollywood is the most prominent one, but it's not the only one. Yeah. So there's actually, you know, and, and one of the things I'm interested in is the sort of traces of Japanese culture, Japanese film. Um, in this period. So Korean filmmakers are still very much looking at Japanese film. Yeah. They are, they're reading the Japanese film magazines, they're looking at film textbooks. Um, Japanese films, I think, are even being smuggled in in some instances. So there's a way in which the, the, that cosmopolitan gets at the sense 
of there's other players involved and not just the US. And it also has that, I think that, it, it, you know, that there's a sophistication, I think, of what, you know, in Han's films, um, and it's attractive. You know, there is that attractive that this this stuff is compelling and attractive and desirable and positive and transnational is sort of a, new, a neutral turn and cosmopolitanism is is a is a more kind of positive and just conveys the sort of the desirability of it. Yeah, yeah. And he captures a lot of the urban space, right? I mean, it, it's yeah. kind of, you know, coming together of the cosmos, right? Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm glad you brought up the, uh, uh, I'm glad you brought up Nora No, because the next question is, do you know who did the costumes, costumes for Han's movies? You mentioned Nora No in the presentation. Did she work directly with him? Were they made for the film specifically or sourced from what was out there already? So she, Nora No worked in the film business and she, um, in film industry, and she worked with a lot of directors. She worked a lot with Shin Sun Ok actually in his films. So I think this is the only, uh, A Female Boss is the only film in which she did the costumes, um, but that film has a lot of costumes. So um, she would have, they would have been designed and made specifically for the film. Um, there's not, this is something I think that's easy to forget, but um, women's clothes, you didn't go to the store and buy women's clothes, they're all made. Um, oh. That there, there weren't department stores with racks and racks of women's clothes like that we have now. So you would have to, you would, there would be dressmakers in, 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 you know, in every neighborhood and they'd be making the dresses. So you'd go and you'd say, hey, I saw this in a film or here's a magazine, here's a picture of what I saw. And they would make it for you. Um, and so that's what Nora Noah was doing. Right. Okay. So we only have about a few minutes left. And I, I purposely saved this question because I thought it would be a good way to end today's session. Uh, the only problem is I got to find it now. Uh, it's way back in sort of the early, here it is right here. Um, it's by Yuna Lee. Following your discussion about the US AIDS and cultural diplomacy in Asia, do you observe Cold War cosmopolitanism in other Asian countries, such as Japan, Vietnam, or India, where the US economic and cultural aid programs were prominent? So now we're leaving Korea, we're going sort of the rest of Asia with the U.S. tentacles reaching out to all these countries. Yes, um, definitely. It's not unique to Korea. Um, and I obviously, I don't, I didn't spend a lot of time researching other parts of the world, but, you know, Hong Kong cinema in the 1950s and 60s is very Cold War cosmopolitanism. It's very, you know, a lot of the same thing as like women and um you know, pushing at boundaries, being modern, embracing American stuff. There's that great film, Mambo Girl. Yeah. Um, and uh, so lots of Hong Kong stuff, which also has a lot of that, that same kind of, you know, the, the love of the fashion and the hairstyle and all that kind of stuff and these great actresses. Um, also in Japan, you see it in Japan in various places as well, turning up in the literature or in magazine stories. Um, um, and I, and actually one of the things that really got me thinking about this was a book about, um, uh, it's Rob Nixon's book about, um, about South Africa. And it was about, um, God, I'm trying to dig this up from the back of my brain, but it's about, um, you know, the, the black South Africans in, uh, Johannesburg in, I guess, I think it's the fifties and sort of how they're using it's a time when the apartheid government is trying to impose um, you know, the apartheid regime, part of which is involved saying, well, black Africans, black South Africans are rural and they are traditional um, and they are sort of, you know, kind of backward. And, and so black South Africans are using all this American culture, um, you know, whether it's jazz or fashion or cars and, and a lot of stuff coming from um, black Americans and set as a way to construct an identity for themselves as modern and urban. Yeah. And, and so I was fascinated by that, that you know, after World War II, there's a ton of American stuff going all out into the world through commercial venues, through you know, aid and US government venues, all kinds of ways, all the ways of waging the cultural Cold War. And what I was fascinated by is people use that stuff for their own ends, mm. right? And they construct their own identities. Um, and fight their own sort of local battles 
in their countries and their societies. Mm. And that was really interesting to me and really made me think like, okay, what are Koreans doing with all this stuff? Yeah. You know, Han Young Mo's not doing Washington's bidding. He's yeah. doing his own work. Yeah. You know, Helen Kim is, is, isn't doing Washington's bidding. She's using those resources to push for what she wants. Yeah. Um, so that to me is, I think is, uh, is, a, and I wonder, I'm interested in those in flipping the straight, we can all write these books about, you know, critique American hegemony and American imperialism. And there's enormous amount of truth in that. Um, but I wanted to tell a story about Korean agency and Korean creativity and to flip the script. So it's not always America acting upon the world, but it's Koreans acting upon America, that yeah. America is the object on which su Korean subjects act. Yeah. You know, they take their stuff, they learn from their films, they, take their spam and make their own bude jige with it. You know, they take American stuff and work with it and they make something else with it. And that thing is, that stuff is very, it's genuinely authentically Korean and it meets Korean needs in a Korean context. And I wanted to just push America to the side. And it's like, yes, it's part of the story, but it's not the agent of this story in that same way. Yeah, that's a, that's a powerful point there, Tina. And, and thank you so much for that. Um, you know, one of my favorite parts in Madam Freedom, just to end this session, it's not really part of the narrative. It's always um, the, everything that's in the mise-en-scene. Uh, yes, there's some uh, authorial intent, but there are times where, uh, you know, there are mistakes that can't be accounted for. And one of the things I really like about Madame Freedom, or just this period uh, in the 50s and 60s, is when they're not using extras, they're actually using real people in the streets and they're watching the camera, right? They're watching, <laughs> they're watching everything that's being played out right now, right? Because it's so new, right? It's so new and so fascinating. Uh, or it could be like, what are those guys doing over there, right? What's, what's happening over there? And they're just looking over. And I love it when, when those things are captured uh, uh, in film because um, it just really shows this absolute interest in, in something that's beyond, you know, what's happening in real life, right? That, you know, there's this desire to be part of something that's being filmed right now, right? Um, and those are always my favorite parts. Whenever I see those in, in old um, films, I, it always fascinates me. But if, when I see this in like, um, you know, uh, films today, and people just happen to glance at a camera by mistake. I love catching those mistakes, right? So, it, you know, it's, the film world is so fascinating, right? To a lot of people still. Um, and I think you're, uh, I think this period in the 50s and 60s is absolutely fascinating in Korean cinema history. And uh, I thoroughly enjoyed your book. I thoroughly enjoyed uh, discussing this book with you. And I thank you so much for giving us your time uh to uh, you know sharing this book with us and i want to thank everyone who has attended today um thank you for sticking around um and i'm sorry i couldn't get to all of your questions otherwise this would have been a 24-hour marathon uh and so maybe we'll do that next time but uh for now uh thank you so much for attending and i wish you well stay safe and healthy and be sure to vote on tuesday uh, yes tuesday so thank you very much Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you. It's wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for all you people out there um, in TV land, as they say, for your yeah. questions and for showing up. And it's great. Go get the book. It's free. Watch Han Hyung movies. They're also free. Um, and thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.